Hi everyone, here's a question for you. How often should you realign your radio? Every five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, never? Uh, what do you think? Uh, my policy so far has been that I generally don't realign a radio unless there's a good reason to do so. Um, and it's just worth considering, I think, about whether we can come to any conclusions about, about that. If you think about the IF frequency, and I think both of these are 470 kilohertz, what's, what controls that? Well, it's the value of the L and the value of the C. Um, and you've got to think, well, are the Ls like to change? Are the inductors like to change? Well, not very much, really. I think one of the things that affects the ferrite is compression. If a ferrite core is compressed, I know that can change the inductance a lot. Um, but they're not going to be compressed in this. Uh, possibly vibration, maybe the, the tuning slugs move a little bit. Yeah, that's possible. But generally they're fixed, you know, fixed with wax or varnish or something to stop that happening. So I don't think the L's are going to change very much. What about the C's? Well, do C's change uh, over a long, long period? The answer is, yeah, very definitely they do. Uh, but of course there's capacitors and capacitors. These are not big electrolytic capacitors in here, which you know can change significantly. They're very small, typically something like about 100 puff. Dielectric might be ceramic, might be silver micro, I suppose. I don't, I don't know, but you know they're not going to change very much. But having said that, I just did a few calculations and I said, well, what would happen if the value of C changed by, say, 1%? Well, it turns out that the frequency would change by about half a percent. Doesn't sound very much. But if you think that the frequency should be 470 kilohertz and you move that by half a percent, that's just over a couple of kilohertz. Now, the bandwidth of the IF stage is going to be something like about 8, 9 or 10 kilohertz. It's going to be supposed to be about twice the audio bandwidth. But shifting it by 2 kilohertz is actually quite significant. So I'm now wondering whether, you know, whether, whether they should be adjusted more often. And I know that uh, a lot of people, every time that they service any kind of radio, they will adjust it. Now, I haven't done that. Now, years ago, uh, what I would do when... <laughs> I was younger, had more hair and possibly less sense. <laughs> if a radio didn't work, well, I'd get in there with my metal screwdriver like this and uh, I'd start twiddling the coils. I had no idea, of course, what I was doing. Sometimes I would get lucky. Uh, but most of the time I'd end up kind of breaking the slugs, the tuning slugs, uh, not understanding that anything metal, of course, is going to change the inductance while you do it, and had no idea of what I was actually aiming for. Um, and if you do get a radio that doesn't work at all, it's most unlikely that the first thing you should do is twiddle the coils. I would say, you know, don't unless you're going to, unless you're going to, um, if you've got some really, really good equipment to have a look and see what, see what's going on. So what I thought I would do is just have a look at this DAC 10 here. Now it just so happens that I know a bit about the history of this. Because I bought this in 1971 uh, when I was 13 years old. There you go, you can work out how old I am now. <laughs> and I remember it was 1971 because it was the year that decimalisation came in in the UK. Um, and we changed our, our monetary system. And I can remember that I was on holiday with my grandmother and I paid the princely sum of 25 pence for this thing at a jumbo sale, which I thought was quite a lot of money at the time. Um, and I say, in those days, you know, if a raid didn't work, I, I, would, I would attack it with my screwdriver and do all sorts of things. But I know for sure that for some reason, this radio escaped my, my antics. And I know that in 50 years, these coils have not been adjusted. Um, so I thought, well... Maybe now's the time to time to do it. Now the reason I've got two radios here is that I just wanted to compare the performance of these two radios. Now I understand that I'm really not comparing apples with apples here because this one here has got a frame aerial. May well first came out in 1950. This one has got a ferrite rod aerial. Came out in 1955. But this one does seem considerably better than this one in terms of gain. Now, in this shed, I know I struggle with signal, 
and I get a lot of mains hum and it has been suggested that maybe it's these LED lights well it isn't actually I mean I, I can turn them out and it makes no difference at all it's just that I do get a lousy signal down here but I've got both these radios on tuned to the same radio station you can just hear something there and this one it's, sig it's significantly better now if I just scan round on this one it's very very difficult to get anything. I've got something a long way sometimes. But this one you know this one is definitely better and it does make me wonder whether I should be realigning this one. So that's what I'm going to do. I am going to try and realign it and show you how I'm doing it. But before I do anything, I want to see if, before I do any adjustments, I want to see if I can actually take some measurements on it to get a measure of um, have I actually improved it? Does it perform any better? Uh, so that's what, that's what I'm going to do. So I'm, I am going to take it out of its chassis and I'm going to try and make some measurements on it and um, then after I've realigned it we'll make some more measurements and see whether we can see any improvement. So here's the setup. Uh, I've got a scope there, signal generator, radio there, most important isolation transformer. Now when I read this about alignment um, it talks about um, first of all putting a signal in here and adjusting these cores here and then finally you want to put it in here and adjust those cores and then it says you know that's the input and then they just say the output it doesn't mention quite where the output is but what I'm going to do is we are going to put a signal in here and I'm going to say the output is going to be across the volume control at that point there so first of all, what I'm going to do is just have a little little play around and see whether um, putting a signal in there, getting a signal out there, is what we want to do. The signal generator. Um, the amplitude on here is apparently peak to peak, so I found out. And it's also got a 50 ohm output resistance. And what that means is, is that this amplitude here is before... The output resistance so if you're driving an open circuit that amplitude is quite correct but if you then put a 50 ohm load on it that amplitude is actually saying twice what you're actually getting out now what I've got here is I'm feeding a signal directly to the scope but what's being fed to the radio is through an attenuator it just gives me a bit bit more control it just makes life a bit easier so you just got to bear that in mind the radio is actually seeing 20 dBs less than what it shows on the scope and this amplitude here is twice what you're actually seeing on the scope because the input resistance of the attenuator is 50 ohms. Hope that makes sense. So to connect the input to this grid here um, you notice that it's actually the aerial connection it's the green wire uh, so that's where we're going to put it. And I've gone through a serious capacitor here because I don't want to upset the DC conditions. I know that my signal generator is not AC coupled, so I've got a capacitor in there. The value is not very important, it just needs to be large enough to uh, not have any influence. It's worth just experimenting with a few values, but I've gone, for, I've gone for 10 nanofarads, but 100 nanofarads would be equally good. If you go smaller than that, you can have an effect, but um, it's not important. 10 nanofarads is what I've got. And the output is connected directly to the volume control, the top of the volume control. Got that with the Time Tens probe in here. The top trace, the yellow trace, is the output, and the bottom trace blue is the input. And at the minute, uh, coming from my signal generator, it says that I've got 50 millivolts input, um, and we know the reasons why that doesn't tie up with the scope particularly. But what I wanted to show you was. If that's 50 millivolts input and you can see the output is about what half a volt, something like that. If I double the input, which I'll do now, 
So that's 0.1 of a volt. Can you see that the output hasn't doubled? All right, I'll do it again. Let me go back. I go back to 50 millivolts. Okay, and I'm getting about half a volt out, something like that. If I go back to 0.1 input, well, it's gone to about 625 millivolts, so it hasn't doubled. So there's something going on here. Now, what that is about, that is the automatic gain control, which we do need to get our heads around. Uh, the perfect radio, of course, will give all give an output for all signals at the same volume. So if you've got a weak signal, then the gain of the amplifier will adjust itself to give you a decent volume on the output. And if it's a strong signal, the gain will shut down. Um, and that's the automatic gain control. So before we go any further, it's worth just working out what we're going to do about that. Because if I come along and measure the frequency response, and at the minute it's 465 kilohertz, um, my signal generator. But if I come along and, and keep the input constant, then I don't really know what the output means because it all depends on how the AGC is set. Um, so let's just get ahead around that. So to find out how the AGC works, the clue is these arrows. All right, and the arrows mean that these valves are designed to have a variable gain. And what you have to work out is, well, what is it you have to do to those valves to be able to change the gain? What we need to do is to look at the data sheet and this is taken from the UF41 data, and they have this parameter called S, which is really gain. Okay, you know, I call it mutual conductance, but you know, the microamps is anode current, and the volts is grid volts, and they're saying that that will vary anything from, what, 3,000 microamps per volt, all the way down to one. And what you have to do is you have to change the grid volts. So you put a more negative grid volt on it, and um, the gain comes right down. Uh, so that's what we're looking for. How do we change the grid volts? How do we increase the negative grid volts to reduce the gain? And you can see there's a tapping off of this IF transformer here through a capacitor onto the valve and then onto a load resistor. Well, what happens is this valve's a diode and what happens is that the um, that it's caught really at about 0 volts, somewhere around 0 volts. So that point will never go higher than about 0 volts. So effectively what happens is you've got a level shifter. So you've got the signal coming along there, which is the IF frequency, and it's level shifted where the top of the peak is around 0 volts. So it means the bottom of the peak is going to get bigger depending on the signal. And what happens is you've then got a load resistor there, comes along here, and if you look at this R and the C, it takes the average value. So it's a DC value. And if you look, follow that through, through that IF transformer, straight onto the grid of this valve. So what happens is that whole IF transformer moves up and down on a DC value, depending on the value of this output signal here. But not only that, if you come along here, again, there's another R and a C straight onto the aerial there, the aerial then goes straight into the grid. So this whole aerial moves up and down from a DC point of view. Um, and that's how you control the gain. So it's done on both of these valves. So the larger the signal, and let's say it's the output, but it's not quite the output, because if it was the output, it would be taken from the secondary side, it's from the primary side. But it's got more to do with the output than the input. So depending on the on that output signal there depends on the gain. And what that means is we then got to make a decision about um, how I'm going to measure the gain of this. Do I take the output divided by the input and keep the input constant? Do I keep the output constant? And the answer is no. What you have to do is to keep this AGC voltage constant. And we can either measure it at that point or I can measure it uh, on there and it doesn't really matter where. So the meter is connected to the junction of R5 and C13 all right, which is essentially going to be the DC voltage on the grid of V2. Um, and the question is well what voltage should I have there? Uh, it's dependent on signal strength. Now I've gone for 5 volts 
and the reason I've gone for 5 volts is that if you have a voltage which is too low or very low the gain is very high and you can see I've got some jitter on that on that waveform now that's because there is some mains I'm coming into this thing and the higher the gain the worse that problem is on the other hand if you have that voltage too high then it means the gain is going to be unrealistically low uh, 5 volts seem to be about right but again it doesn't matter really as long as I use choose the same voltage when I measure it the second time I've dispensed with channel 2 now because I only really want to look at the output uh, so what I'm going to note down is the peak to peak voltage there making sure that my input there is 5 I've just got to keep tweaking that a little bit on the signal generator and I'm noting down the signal generator voltage again we know it's not not really the voltage which is going into the radio but it is proportional to it which is all that matters so uh, we can see we've got the jitter on there so I'm just going to hit run stop put the cursors up and yeah, it looks about right actually and just measure the peak to peak there and I can see that I've got 1.16 volts so that's the first one 1.16 volts my signal generator is saying 59 millivolts and I've got the 5 volts and that is at 465 kilohertz now I'm going to move very gently away either side of 465 probably in something like about 100 hertz steps maybe um, we'll see how it goes but leave me to do all that um, with various frequencies and then we'll pop it on a graph and we'll see what we got well in the end I started again because um, I found that the position of the tuning capacitor made a bit of difference and it doesn't matter where I have it particularly as long as I make a note of where I have it so that when I do it a second time I do the same thing so I went for um, tuning capacitance maximum capacitance all right the other thing that made a difference was the volume control whilst I'm checking on the top of the volume control for my output um, the low changes depending on where the volume control is so again it doesn't matter where I have it but I've got to repeat it in the same place so I've gone for minimum volume and um, this is what we got well it's certainly not out by a mile um, but it is a bit skew so 465 in the middle um, it's looking like I'm getting a, a six, about 6 kilohertz bandwidth which means the audio bandwidth is only going to be about 3 kilohertz but you know there you go um, so you know being a bit skew I, it makes me wonder whether one coil is sort of a little bit low in frequency and the other one maybe a bit high or something I'm I'm not sure but you know the question in my mind is well can I improve it if I follow the instructions to the letter which we will do and if I have improved it does it actually improve the performance of the radio um, we will see so the other test I want to do is to try and get uh, a measure of its RF gain um, and to do that I've got this uh, highly scientific piece of kit here uh, called a lump of wood and a bit of wire <laughs> what they tell you to do when you're tweaking it is to connect a loop it says in the text about 10 inches by 8 inches about 15 inches apart from the um, from the aerial and just connect that across your signal generator um, and I've done that but of course I've got to get my measurement the same when I measure it the second time so that piece of wood there is about 15 inches long something like that um, and I have connected this to the signal generator but I've got a, I've got a 1k resistor in series with it um, that allows me to set my signal generator at maximum 20, 20 volts peak to peak and I get a signal level just right uh, in terms of measuring it to find out what is the maximum I've just got an old AVO connected up there across the speaker oh by the way I've got a, got, got a dummy load there and a speaker underneath the bench so I can just switch the two otherwise the squealing drives you nuts <laughs> so I've got an old AVO there um, and I know that to read AVOs they should be horizontally mounted but I'm not too worried because all I want to know use that for is to find the maximum I'll read the actual value off the DVM again that won't be accurate because I'm going to modulate it at a kilohertz and I don't know how that whether that likes a kilohertz or not but it doesn't matter because as long as I do it the same each time uh, so that's what I'm going to do right let's have a go then um, so I've got 600 kilohertz 50% modulation uh, and I'm just going to you can hear it there you can tune it in 
There's a little scale there which um, is pretty accurate at the moment. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to turn this up, put the dummy load on, go to maximum volume, and I can see the maximum on the AVO and just note down what it says on the DVM. It's about... That's probably about it. 1.531. Then we want to do 1.5 megs. So let's just change that. Let's get in there. One and a half megs. Turn the volume back down again so I can hear it. Should be up here. There it is. Put the dummy load on again. Maximum volume. Pretty much, pretty much the same. Let's just say one point five five, something like that. One point five four four. Okay, and there's my meter just about to go off, so we'll just reset that. Okay, turn the volume down, back onto speaker. Now we want uh, 150 kilohertz. So let's just wind that all the way down. That's 150 kilohertz, long wave. Careful not to electrocute myself. Got to find that, that should be up here. There it is. Dummy load. Maximum volume. It's about there somewhere. About there, I think. 1.436 Okay, then I want 300 kilohertz. Turn the volume down, back on the speaker. 300 kilohertz, that's the other end. There it is. Dummy load, volume at max. That's about right. 1.49. Okay. The next thing I've got to do now is to go and make myself a little tool for adjusting the uh, IF transformers. So there's the IF transformers that we've got to adjust. And I've managed to 3D print the special tool to adjust it with. It's just a little slot, so it's... Uh, uh, I've managed to convert one of those into one of those. And there's a lock nut on there, which is an 8BA lock nut. Um, so I've had to make a little 8BA box banner out of plastic. I'll show you, show you how, to, how it all goes together in a minute. But the files are uh, up there if you need to if you need to download the 3D files, just uh, just help yourself. So reading the instructions, switch set to medium wave, tune to approximately 300 meters. Uh, there's a mark on the scale just underneath, uh, which is marked to megahertz, so that is uh, 300 meters. Unscrew the cores fully of coils L13, 12, 11, and 10. Uh, connect the Output of signal generator, control grid pin 6 of V2. Okay, now what I've done is I've soldered a wire underneath here uh, because it's, it's easiest. I'm feeding 465 kilohertz. The important thing is make sure your signal generator is AC coupled. Mine isn't, 
So I've got my 10 nanofarad capacitor in, which I think you can just about see here. Uh, I've got the box spanner on there, so I previously just unlocked the nut there. I've got my meter there, just to indicate the maximum. And there is just something there. And I'm feeding in 465 kilohertz. So it looks like I've got about 79 millivolts at the moment. Uh, and if I screw this adjuster in, it starts getting uncomfortably loud. So switch over to a dummy load now. And hopefully you can see the meter there. But it's just coming up. Oh, there it went past the peak there. And what it reads doesn't matter, it's just I want to find the maximum, which is there. Just turn the lock nut there without adjusting the. So that's that one done. Then we've got to do the bottom one. Let me just push that box spanner on there. And tweak this one. Push that a little bit further. Now it's coming up now. We've got about a volt, so I'm just going to reduce the gain now of the signal generator because we really want to avoid any AGC action if we can. Keep it fairly low. That's gone past the vault, so I'm still going to take it down more. Oh, not, not that much, perhaps. I'm onto 100 millivolts going in there now. There it is, there's the peak. Right, let's just get that exactly on the money then, which is about there. Screw that lock nut up. Just wonder if I moved it, I'm just going to check again. Just get the peak. That's it there. Right. That's that IF transformer done. Right, next bit is uh, transfer live signal generator lead to control grid pin 6 of V1. Adjust the cores L11 and L10 in that order for maximum output. Now we know that that is the uh, aerial connection. So we put it straight on the aerial connection. Now we're probably going to have to um, turn the volume down a bit, I suspect. Turn the gain down a bit. Let's have a look and see. Just, just going to put the speaker on. See if we can hear anything. There we go, I can hear something now. Not very much. Right, okay, let's see whether we can get some... There we are, getting louder. Put that on dummy load now. There's the peak. There it is. And it looks like about 0.9 of a volt. We'll just get that right and tweak the lock nut up. Hang on. There we go, that's that one done. Move down onto this one. This is the final one. Gain's going up, so I'm just going to reduce my signal generator output down to 30 millivolts, 20 millivolts now. Still going up. Oh, that's still quite high. 
10 millivolts. I think I should have put an attenuator in here. Anyway, that's all right. 5 millivolts. There's the peak. There it is. Just get that spot on. It's about there. Lock that off. Right, and that's the IF transformers adjusted. Well, this is what I got, folks. Um, the blue line is what I had before, and the orange line is what I've adjusted it to, following the instructions to the letter. And uh, sorry about the noise, it's, <laughs> it's blowing an absolute hoolie out there, so it's a lot of uh, rain on the roof, I'm afraid. Anyway, uh, yeah, so looking at that, um it's off isn't it i mean it's it's way off whilst i've got more gain below 465 kilohertz it's definitely off and if i left it like that uh i think i would be worse off than what i am before but i followed the instructions of the letter and the instructions say that you start off by putting the signal on the grid of v2 and adjusting l13 and l12 and then you move your signal to the grid of V1 and adjust 11 and L11 and L10 in that order. But then it specifically says, do not readjust the cores L13 and L12. Well, um, that's what you get. So then I kind of ignored the instructions and left my signal generator connected to the grid of V1 and just tweaked them. And you can see that I'm pretty much identical to, to, to how it was started off. You know, you could argue that maybe the orange line had got a little bit more gain at lower frequency, a little more gain at higher frequency, perhaps it's a bit better. So yeah, it is marginally better, but frankly that is not going to make any difference. So at the moment, I'm pretty much concluding that after 50 years, the adjustment for the IF transformer just hasn't changed. Okay, so it's back uh, on the lump of wood with the uh, little aerial there. Um, I've got to uh, start doing the RF uh, adjustments now. Uh, first thing it tells me to do, it says wind the um, tuning cap to maximum capacitance and check that it's maximum on the scale, and uh, it is, absolutely. And I've got to uh, adjust these little things here. It's quite interesting, and I've never seen anything quite like this, but you've got... Um, an inductor in the middle and then you rotate these uh, for the capacitors so quite interesting so we've got to have a go at that now I have twiddled them a little bit just to free them up so uh, we're going to set them all up again as per instructions so it tells me to feed in 600 kilohertz and adjust L6 for maximum uh, having set it to 0.6 on the scale which I have done and you can hear it there, so I'm just going to go to dummy load, turn the volume up to maximum. I can see it on there, and I've just got to tweak L6 here. And that's going down, that's going back up. Now don't I think the fact that it's that it's moved quite a bit doesn't actually mean anything because I did twiddle them just to, just to free them up so I just want to get that right on the maximum which I think is about it's about there so then it says uh, tune your scale to 1.5 feed in one and a half kilohertz and adjust C35 and C32 for maximum output Oh, there it is. Put that on dummy load so I can see it. Now this is the C35 and I'm just doing it with my hand here. Now oh, that's increasing a bit. That's, that's gone past the peak. It's about yeah. it's about there. That's C thirty five and C thirty two. Or 
that's increased it a bit. Going up. That's gone past the peak. Let's just get that back again. That's a that's about it, I reckon. Then it asked me to recheck calibration at 500 meters, uh, 600 kilohertz, and it is it is spot on. That's fine. Then for long wave, put 150 kilohertz in, uh, put the scale correct, and you adjust L7 for maximum output. There it is. Yeah, there's a definite peak there. Put it on dummy load, turn the volume up to maximum. Tweak that for the maximum. There we go. That's about it. Then it says 300 kilohertz, put the scale right and adjust C36 and C31. Right, well, there it is. So I'm just going to do this by hand, I think. That was a peak. Now, I've just gone past. Oh. Now there's the peak, it's about there, and then tweak this one, that's increased it a bit, that was the peak, there we go, job done. Then I've got the preset stations, but I'm not going to worry about that for the moment. That's, uh, that's another issue. So here's the results of the RF test. Um, it's looking pretty similar, to be honest. You could argue it down at 150 kilohertz. I haven't got it quite as good as it was. Uh, but to be honest, you've only got to move your arm around in here, and it, it makes, uh, makes quite a bit of difference. So uh, there's nothing of any great accuracy in this test. So the thing to do next now is for me to clean it all up, do all the usual stuff, you know, make sure the volume controls are uh, not crackly, uh, clean it all up. Uh, the X capacitor has been changed on this, I can see that. Uh, it looks like my work, so I think, think I did that some years ago. <laughs> and uh, put it all back and uh, see what we got. There it is, folks. I think it's cleaned up really nicely, actually. Uh, the badge is missing at the front, but it's, but it's not bad. Um, I've tuned in a couple of a couple of stations which we get reasonably strongly up here. I say reasonably strong, but we don't really get very good signal at all. But it is better in my dining room here. So that's uh, Radio 4, which is not bad. And that is smooth. A government minister has admitted it's worrying. It's not bad. It's not bad. Um, I've formed a bit of an opinion, really, about... Uh, the, the um, frame, air, frame, frame aerial in here. I don't think it's good, as good as the ferrite rod aerials. What happens is it picks up a lot of noise from within the radio. I've proved that the hum is coming through the aerial because if you short the aerial out, you just get absolutely nothing. Um, so there it is. I think, I think adjusting IF transformers is tricky. It's uh, a very, very sensitive adjustment and really I think I need to think about maybe getting a slightly better way, a bit, bit more sensitivity on it one way or another. So I think the policy of just leaving these things alone is probably quite a good one, uh, unless of course you know that it has been twiddled, or you suspect it's been twiddled, but of course there lies a problem, you don't really know. Sometimes you can see the varnish, sometimes not. But anyway, there it is, so uh, hopefully I'll make some more videos in due course, hope you've enjoyed this one, cheers.